everyone. I am Stacey Wilson Hunt, and welcome to Comic Con at Home, the panel for HBO's His Dark Materials. How is everyone? Good. Very good. good. Hey. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me introduce everyone because I want to make sure each of you is is known and introduced properly to all of your fans. Let's start with executive producer Jane Tranter. Hello, Hello. Jane. Hello, Jane. Executive producer and writer Jack Thorne. Hello, Jack. Woo! <laughs> and we have our amazing cast members, Daphne Keene as Lyra. Hello, Daphne. Hey. We have Ruth Wilson as Mrs. Coulter. Hey. <laughs> Ariane Bakari as Lord Boreal. Hey. 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 <laughs> Amir Wilson as Will Perry. Yes. Hey. Andrew Scott as John Perry. New cast member, new cast member, And finally, and, and of course not lastly, Lynn manuel Miranda as Lee Scoresby. Hello. Hello. We are so happy to have everyone here today amidst such a strange time in humanity, this time of our lives, but we're so honored to have you here. And so before we get into the conversation, we do have a treat for everyone. We do want to show all the fans of His Dark Materials the trailer for season two. So let's take a look at that right now. You're not from here, are you? From this world? No. Neither am I. There are multiple worlds up there. And people will be looking for her. Not all of them good. I found her. These troubled times call for the Magisterium to take control. Best word, keep her safe. This knife could cut between worlds. Everyone's connected. Lyra, how do you know about me? You have something important to do. The time has come to act. I believe we have no choice. People are afraid of things they don't understand. These are strange new times. Wow, I think we can all agree that looks incredible and we cannot wait for season two. So Jane and Jack, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on an amazing season one. What a Herculean effort, to say the least, to adapt these amazing novels by Philip Pullman. I would love to know what has meant the most to you and how fans have received the series. I mean, obviously the most gratifying thing is that the fans of the book have become fans of the television adaptation. Um, it's the thing that you you kind of dread. Are they going to like it or are they not? And the fans of his dark materials are really, really passionate and clever and interested, engaged, and they have lots of really good things to say. And so we did watch it go out episode by episode with the fans. And I think the gratifying thing was how they embraced what we'd done. As we began to introduce boreal crossing between <laughs> the worlds and there was a sense of uh, you know how, how's that happening and the fact that boreal was such a big character in season one and you you watch them put it all together until finally boreal got put together with will parry and we introduced will and the fans were then okay but he's not in it until the subtle knife and then they saw us play out Will's backstory and saw what we were doing. That was probably, I mean, one of the most interactive and exciting audience experiences um, we could have hoped for. And uh, we're just very proud that the fans responded and, and pleased and relieved the fans mm. responded in the way they did. You're all very wonderful. And I'm sure Jack felt a huge sigh of relief <laughs> when, uh, yeah. when, when, that, when those uh, reports were coming in via social media and, and amazing, really wonderful critical reviews too. So Jack, tell me, as the, the main writer in the trenches and bringing these novels to life for the screen, what is the hardest part of adapting a book series like this? Adapting anything is difficult. What is so intrinsically difficult about these stories and this mythology that may surprise people? The denseness of, of Philip's world. 
that that this is not one where you can go oh there's this thing and then there's this thing and then there's this thing it's like there's these things and they're all going to hit you all at the same time and if you don't if you don't go with us uh if you sit looking at your phone you're going to look up in a minute and go I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what they're talking yeah. about. Yes. And I have no idea why everyone's, you know, obsessed with dust. And and I think that was the thing more than anything. And and we were we were trying to do a show, you know, the, the, the thing that was most gratifying for me was this was a sofa show. This was a show that people watched with their families, where, you know, I had playwright friends of mine who were like, you know, I'm watching this with my kids and I'm watching this with my mum. And do you know what I mean? Like, you know, and that thing of just trying to trying to make sure that everyone went with it everyone understood it to some degree from 8 to 80 and um and uh you know and that that was tricky but amazing you know that philip is a wonder and uh and 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 trying to do justice to him was the hardest job in my life but it was also a wonderful job and by the way has he given you uh, his blessing and feedback on what he has seen so far Yes, yes, he has. He's been very lovely. He's been oh, very good. lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it yeah. could go the other way. You never know. <laughs> yep. Nope. I've been there. I can. Yeah. <laughs> I can say. I can say that to spare Jack's blushes. But Philip has. I, I think he's reached out to everybody. He's. He's been. Uh, it, it, it was re- actually that was a very gratifying thing was to actually watch Sir Philip Pullman's reaction to our adaptation along with all of his fans. He was very uh, appreciative. So I'd love to shift over to Daphne. Hello, Daphne. Hi. We don't want to recap all of season one for people who may be just discovering the series, but it's, it's suffice to say that she ends the season in a, almost a literal and figurative free fall. <laughs> we, she has just had this epiphany about her family and her relationship with mm-hmm. Mrs. Coulter. What would you describe as Lyra's state of mind now going into season two? How, did, how conflicted does she feel the world and the family that she thought she knew has completely been upended. For me, it actually felt like a Darth Vader, Luke, Star Wars moment. <laughs> it's like that, that sort That's of a shock. Good reference. <laughs> Tell me what you think where she is in, in her mindset, but also emotionally right now. I feel like when you first meet Lyra, she's a very outgoing person. She trusts very easily. But going into season two, after having realized that the only thing that gave her stability, which was the alethiometer and Roger, and now like they're both gone which means that I can trust no one I can trust nothing which is what's so beautiful about season two it's seeing how she starts off being closed and like in her own shell and stuff and will sort of brings her out back into the world and back into Lyra and how has this story and how has her story made you rethink your relationship with your own parents you're you're very close with them they're also artists and actually one of them does appear in the show tell us who that is well my dad's real keen and he plays Father McPhail so that's fun. I was, I've acted with my dad in the past. I appreciate my parents after having worked on this because they haven't killed anyone. So that's great. <laughs> that's always a good sign. That's a really good sign. I do want to talk to Amir. Hello, hello, hello. So we didn't see a lot of Will in uh, season one, and we so, sort of saw a lot of hinting at, at what lay in front of him. But first of all, I wanted to know how much pressure did you feel as an actor bringing this character to life, knowing again what we just discussed with the showrunners, the impassioned nature of the fans and how they want to make sure that these characters are brought to light exactly as they were written. So tell me the pressure uh, you felt, but also the freedom to sort of reinvent this character for the screen. I, well, I knew that Will hadn't, wasn't in book one and I knew that we were, we were going to put Will in season one. And I... At first, I didn't know how the fans would react to that because, of course, that you know, like fans are really when it comes to books and adaptations of books, fans are quite serious about you know sticking to the story and making sure you know everything's how it is in the books. But um, in terms of yeah, it was a little bit of pressure, and it's because you know when you're bringing any character to life that's based off a book, someone in a book, or or anyone, is there's a pressure to you know to like make sure you present them how they are in the book, but also you know adding a bit. Of yourself to that character and not just making 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 it your own um but i yeah i felt i felt the freedom to just yeah do my thing and um yeah i, I hope i did a good job <laughs> hey, you did your thing well man <laughs> thank you thank you thank you very much you and 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 daphne are the two younger actors here with us today who are in, in the series tell me a little bit about first of all your first impressions of each other 
how did you bond and what did you find um, similarities in each other? Well, I mean, well, we met for the first time in Madrid. So I was, I was filming in Prague at the time. And then um, I got, when I got the part, they said, you know, we want you to meet Daphne like pretty much straight away. So like the, in the next week, they flew me out to Madrid and then we went out together. I think one thing we shared in common is that, you know, we're both, we both moved away from home and we both, you know, have to live. We moved to Cardiff together and we're, yeah, we both, we all, you know, we all said the same things, like how we both hate school and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, going three having, months having, off. Oh, <laughs> had to be at school for three months. It must have been great. They split the room. So it was like Daphne on one side and me on the other. So there was no communication at all. We were just like locked, locked in a room. And um, so we couldn't even call each other. Like there was my tutor room, a, like shared, and not shared, and then a mere tutor room. So we couldn't even like hear each other. Me and Daphne lived like a five minute walk away from each other. And we lived next to like this really nice park in, in, in Cardiff. Um, I can't remember the name. Is it Butte Park? Is that what it's called? Yes. Butte Park, Butte Park. Um, so we'd go for walks and stuff. And um, yeah, it was nice. Um, it was it was fun. It's nice to have a friend at work, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and there was the only person, like the only kid who went up for Will that I didn't meet. I met all of the other people who went up for Will. And as like Samir said, he was in Prague, was it? Yeah, he was in Prague. And then he got called into Madrid. And I was like, right. I'm going to be filming with him for like half a year. So I really need to get on with him. I'd love to talk to Ruth, who looks way too glam and had way too much of an advantage over the rest of us. For, That's just for, how she it's, looks. It's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> like every day. These are my pajamas. So I'd love to talk about your character. And, and she is someone who I think, suffice to say, challenges our perception of good and evil. I find myself alternately sort of loathing her, but feeling for her and still not understanding how we are supposed to feel about her, even at the end of season one. And I'm wondering, to what degree do you see her as a survivor of her circumstances, but also as the villain sort of perpetuating this, this cycle of what I would say is sort of abuse and, and negativity, um, especially toward now this, this young woman who has entered her life in a meaningful way? What is your perception of that? <laughs> Good question. Um, <laughs> easy question to ask. <laughs> yeah, easy question. Um, no, I think look, this, why this character fascinated me was, I mean, the best characters in fiction always for me and to play are ones you never truly understand. And uh, I said to Philip, she's a bit like Hedda Gabler, Ibsen's Gabler. She, you don't ever get to know who she really is. Or you, it's a struggle to work out who she is. And she is constantly um, challenging me and confusing me. And her intentions are always mixed up and different from moment to moment. Um, and I think that what was really joyful in this season to play with was to sort of get underneath her, her circumstances more. Why she, or what she's had to deal with as a woman in a very male world and the sacrifices she's had to make and at what cost, which is really the cost of losing her daughter really or choosing something over her daughter. And I think that's been really interesting. I mean, and Philip, digs into that in the book, but we were given more license to really go further. Jack really sort of dug into that. And I think that was really, really lovely or a really great thing, an angle to look at Mrs. Coulter and to see mm. that side of her. Um, again, she does such horrific things. You need to sort of balance that with mm. like reasons why or potential reasons why, you know? Mm. And we know that by season three, we see her as a completely different person. So you need to find the journey through the three seasons to discover how she gets to where she is at by the end of the, the books. Hmm. Um, so that was really glorious for us to kind of dig into this season. Um, and it's much more about self-discovery. She's on her own a lot, season two. Um, and so it's more about her own, her relationship to herself and her monkey. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the monkey we see in the background yes yeah and and how familiar were you with the books were, were these books part of your stay stable of reading as a kid or did you discover them later shamefully no i had never met <laughs> i've never read them <laughs> i'd heard about them and i heard about the theatrical show at the national which was a huge success um but i'd never read them so it was my first introduction was reading them when i was meeting jane and mm -hmm. um I was just instantly bowled over. They're extraordinary books. And the more you dig in, again, another great sign of great fiction is the more you dig, the more you find. There's just never ending pool of kind of choices and options and things to dig into and psychology. Um, these are really philosophical books. So 
for an actor, it's really fun. Each character has so many layers that you can keep digging um, and coming to dead ends sometimes, but then pulling <laughs> yourself out and finding something else. But no, it's been a joy. I love playing her. She's such a joyful, because she's so horrific, but also there's real damage there, um, which you can play against it. Yeah. Well, you seem to thrive in that space of enigma in, in all the characters you've played that I've seen you play. There's always this enigmatic quality to your, to your characters. So maybe it's that's really, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's just slightly blank moments. <laughs> I, I sincerely doubt that that's true. And Lynn, how are you doing? You've had a busy month or so ish, like, you know, rolling out a, a movie and if. some other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we filmed that movie four yeah, years ago. So true. it's really just been kind of watching the world watch it. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to be on the other side of it. It's nice to like the world just sort of has it now. And it's, yes. and, and there you go. And it's that's brilliant. It's, it's a very rare privilege uh, in the theater to be able to do that. So uh, happy especially to be now. Exactly. And especially when so many of us are craving that theatrical experience. Yeah, absolutely. So, Lynn, you have spoken that, that these books were actually very important to you. And tell me a little bit about the relationship you had with these books and also your wife, because it sounds like you were both fans. And then second yeah. to that, how has it felt to immerse yourself in this world, having already loved it so much? That must be just sort of like the most childhood dream come true. Well, yeah, I, I fell in love with these books around 2005. And, you know, most couples, when they start dating, they have their like first date night or they have their first song. And this was sort of one of the first series we read together. We're both big fantasy and sci-fi fans. And so I remember reading this series. I think Vanessa was a book ahead of me. Um, so we kind of fell in love with the world as we were falling in love with each other. Uh, which mm -hmm. is like, uh, <laughs> 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 love story. I love story. <laughs> yeah. And then to be invited by Jane and Jack into it and sort of see how the sausage gets made and put on my cowboy pantaloon <laughs> and do the thing, um, <laughs> you know, is, is it's very surreal. It's very surreal to be uh, inside this world you've devoted a lot of time to, because, you know, when um, I, I've read the side stories, I've read the novellas Phillips read, I've read Demon Voices, his essays sort of on the theory behind it. And so it's, it's a joy for me. This is like, Space camp for me. <laughs> That's a great comparison. And I'd love to talk a little bit about the chemistry that, that you and Daphne's character have. It, it's sort of akin to, I could see them having their own spinoff, like buddy, buddy comedy movie down the line. But I yes! would love to <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of a, a departure in genre, but I think it could work. But I would love to know what you have learned about acting working with her. Because a lot of older actors who have worked with younger actors talk about this sense of simplicity that young people bring to, to this craft that maybe more experienced actors, maybe you put a little bit too much thought into things. And, and <laughs> for these younger actors, they show up and they're just annoying geniuses. So I'm wondering how much have you <laughs> learned about how to strip away some of the artifice of performance and just sort of let it flow? Well, you're half right about Daphne, but it's the genius part, not the annoying. Part. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> listen, Daphne and I both speak Spanish and we love show tunes. And so that was a very <laughs> quick foundation uh, to, to sort of form our friendship. Um, you know, the thing about season two is I, I, I missed her so much when we were filming season two because I'm li like both, I'm literally, my character is. <laughs> um, was looking for her character, but also we were sort of filming in literally different worlds. So yeah. I would leave the soundstage that contained the world I was in and I'd run over to the world where Will and, and Lyra were and be like, whoa, this is amazing. Hi guys, like, see you at lunch. Uh, <laughs> You know, so it was, you know, we, we bonded very fiercely in the first season and, I, and, and, and a lot of Lee's journey is, in the second season, is about that. It's sort of like he feels this incredible mm -hmm. sense of um, this girl got the, dealt the worst hand when it comes to parents. Um, Oi! I'm going to, I'm going hey, to, I'm going to do what I, no offense, no offense intended. Um, I'm going to do what I can to have her back. And that's, that's really how he spends the, the second season is just mm. doing his best to have her back, even oh. in absentia. <laughs> well, I love that. And so much to look forward to on that front. And next up we have Ariane. Uh, I would love to talk about how you see 
what is driving Boreal in, in this piece? Because he's clearly aligned with Mrs. Coulter, but we also can't always trust what we're seeing on screen. So tell me a little bit about what you think is his internal drive here. His internal drive is ambition. He just wants to be at the top. His thing is that he always felt like he was the outside of, of everything. So his thing is that he just wants to, he wants more power. He's a megalomaniac. He has no sense of feeling. He doesn't really care about anybody else except for himself. And he would step on as many toes as possible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot of dead bodies behind him. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what is it about you and your experience that you think landed you this role? Because you seem like a fairly lighthearted, fun guy. Yeah, it's really strange. Because I've never, ever played like a, a villain, ever. And I did a film once and, and the director said, you'd make an amazing villain. I never really understood why. And he said, just don't, do anything with your face. <laughs> he said, don't put anything on it. Don't put any emotion on it. Just be still and you'll make an amazing villain. And so when I came into this, I was thinking, well, that's what I'm going to try. I'm, gonna not do, I'm not going to give anything away. I'm not going to show anybody. I'm not going to let anybody know how excited I am that I really love the books and I really want this job. I'm just going to be really cold and really kind of like end the meeting, like, yeah, I'm finished now. <laughs> and that's what I kind of did. It was like, I'm not giving anything away. So... Yeah, I've learned to be a villain now. Now I seem to be playing villains all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a problem. We should when say, we should, should say, Stacey. Uh huh. We should say if I, I can. Um, so um, Jack and I and Dan McCulloch saw Aaron's audition. We, we, um, he was everything he said was true. That is exactly as he was, and it was kind of like chilling and scary. Um, and we at that time. Jack was still working on how he was going to thread the, the backstory of Will through the first season. And actually, it was one of those amazing things I've heard people talk about and never actually seen before, when, um, when a writer is looking at the dailies and looking at the whole season come together, and we were lucky enough, we had a pause between editing season one together and starting filming Will's World because we had to wait for Amir to become available. So we couldn't shoot it until later. So Jack had had a chance to see all of the eight episodes, really the first season come together. And it was the power of what Aaron was doing as Boreal when he just said, actually what we need in Will's World is, is a little bit of Boreal and used him as the way in. Um, and it was just a really interesting thing watching a writer watch an actor and think actually we could take this in this direction. Hmm. Wow, that's amazing! That. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm chuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, Andrew, the newest addition to the family. How are you, sir? I'm all right. Good. <laughs> oh, well. We're liking your your quarantine do is looking very chic. No, so well done. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> I have, yet, I have yet to get to a, a barber, so apologies. Uh, it's, no, no, do not apologize. It's a, look, it's a good look for you. So, you know, we saw your photo in season one. We didn't see your full self on screen. Tell me a little bit about what it was like for you to immerse yourself in this world. You know, your co-stars had a whole season head start, and you're jumping in. It's a lot of CG. You're working with a demon, which I assume you've never worked with demons before, but you did play a priest, so that could be possibly yeah. something to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Tell with a few demons. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about adjusting to this high-level fantasy world, which is really, you know, a lot of actors I've spoken to said it, it can be harder than doing Shakespeare. You know, you have to imagine things that aren't there are there. Right. So tell me yeah. a little bit about that adjustment and then what you can share with us about your demon companion after that. Uh, well, uh, it was really exciting. I mean, everybody just went ballistic about the the, the first season. So um, it was, uh, uh, you know, always a little bit intimidating to come in and you don't want to mess it up. So um, hopefully the photo will will, will, will be um, not as disappointing as the <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to life. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, it was really brilliant. And, uh, you know, I got to work with incredible actors. Um, Lynn uh, 
a lot of my stuff was with Lynn and we had such a really good time. We really did. It was a total joy to do that. And so much of the stuff that's so beautiful to me about the books and and, and uh, the series is is the relationship with the demons. And um, so um, I do uh, have a relationship with, with my demon. And I think I'm. this is the, the first time uh, we're, we're, re- we're revealing this, but... Um, uh, my demon is going to be be played by somebody who is uh, very close to me in real life, which is um, a young performer and a writer called Phoebe Waller Bridge. I don't know if you people. Who? Yeah. <laughs> she sounds great. Oh. Phoebe what? what? <laughs> Phoebe what? What? That's very exciting. I'm really thrilled about that because it's all about companionship and friendship <laughs> and loyalty, and, and that's what I feel about Phoebe in in my um, in in my real life. So it's wonderful that um, that uh, that uh, that's that's uh, happening. Oh, that is wonderful, and what a wonderful segue to talk a little bit about the forthcoming season. And Jane, I'm wondering if you can put in some perspective for the fans. You know, you had locked most of your episodes before the global pandemic took place and obviously everything paused. Tell me a little bit about how that has affected the rollout of season two and if at all, and how the the episodes have been impacted in terms of either the way they were cut. Did you have to lose footage? Tell us a little bit about that because I'm sure it, it was not an easy time. The good news is we have managed to keep going uh, the whole way through the lockdown. We have the most amazing post-production team and we are currently, touch wood, um, completely on course for transmitting when we would have transmitted. Mm. Um, we had a, I mean, really, we did have an incredible piece of luck. We were filming um, when the pandemic hit and we did have to stop filming. But we were in a peculiar situation where our main unit had wrapped it just before Christmas 2019. And we had one standalone episode that we were filming in March and it was separate from the other seven episodes because it was a standalone episode which Jack had written uh, with the blessing and with input from Philip Pullman, which looked at what Asriel had been doing between going through the anomaly at the end of season one and when we see Lord Asriel at the beginning of book three, The Amber Spyglass. Because Asriel isn't actually in the subtle knife. He's very much talked about, his presence is very much felt, but he's not actually there. So we played kind of detective with the subtle knife and figured out what Asriel might have been doing. For us, it meant that we could continue post-production on the seven episodes that make up the subtle knife and just put the Asriel standalone episode to one side, and maybe at some point in the future, we can revisit it as a standalone. But essentially, our adaptation of The Southern Life had been completed. So we were really lucky from that point of view. Wow, that is so impressive. And and that's probably one of thousands of stories that will come out of this the last few months of just writers and artists turning on a dime and and really employing their craft Yes. And just amazing team. Amazing so, team. So amazing. Yes. And yes. and Jack, I get the sense you don't like to toot your own horn, but I will ask you, is there something that you're so excited, aside from what she has just described, which sounds so impressive, is there a sequence from the books that you have written for season two that you're very excited for fans to see that that just makes you smile when you think about it? There's a beautiful piece in the book that I have dreamt about writing for a very long time and I was watching it today and it is magnificent yes. and it is heartbreaking. And, uh, and so, yes, I would probably say that, but there's so many bits. Also. <laughs> and, and my DMs are open and you can send it over for me to watch. it. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I do have one question in terms of season one, you know, when, when you're casting a series like this, you know, you cast the best people, you cross your fingers and then the magic sort of unfolds on set. When you sit down to write season two, knowing how wonderful the cast is, and you start to be able to write to their strengths and to their, what they bring to the characters that maybe you didn't know when you were writing the first scripts. Were there any moments like that for you where you thought, okay, now that I know he can do this or she can do that, I'm going to give this, this actor a little bit more this direction or more, more breathing room in this direction. Do you, can you think of any examples like that? Lots. I mean, the, the, uh, that it, it's interesting, as, as, as Daphne said, I think this series is all about trust. I think that what Philip's written in The Cell Knife is a, is a beautiful 
poem about trust, about mm. the way that characters have to learn to trust again. You know, that Will, his life has taught him to trust nothing. And Lyra has learned through series one that, that she can't trust anything. And, and then slowly this sort of beautiful flower emerges of them. And I think that's what the writing process has been about. You know, that, 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 that thing of trusting people's faces. I think probably my mm. favorite moment in, in series one is one without words. Uh, for obvious reasons, but is uh, is just um, Mrs. Coulter sitting by a bath, and what you can do in terms of telling a story. And I think that thing of just trusting actors' faces. Um, I think you know I had a writing team on this, so it's not just me. But I think that thing of just that we we all just trusted faces a lot more to tell story, and mm. uh, you know, and paired back and paired back and paired back and trusted these magnificent people to tell the story mm. through their eyes. And they all have great faces too, which helps. They have lovely, beautiful faces, all of them, yes. So I wanted to ask the actors, what have you learned about each other that is the strangest thing that you couldn't have predicted? Does, does anyone have any habits on set? Does someone have strange music tastes? Does someone have strange food or snack preferences? Does anything come to mind? I'll start with Lynn, because I feel like he's going to have an answer to that. I hope I'm not speaking out of school, Andrew Scott. But one of the things, first of all, you have no idea what it's like to be cooped up in a hot air balloon with Andrew Scott while Fleabag is peaking in the United <laughs> States. That's from women I hadn't talked to in years. <laughs> and I went out, you're in a balloon with hot priest. Um, but we were in a balloon for a long time. So we, we got to be very good friends and we got to hang out a lot. Um, but I think the first thing we bonded over was uh, the television show Judge Judy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of which Mr. Scott is an enormous fan of uh, both Judy and her bailiff and their <laughs> inner life. And we spent a lot of time talking about that. <laughs> that I is, also, une I, that I, is I, unexpected for sure. <laughs> I also um, introduced Lynn. Uh, the British um, uh, uh, people watching will, will uh, recognize this, but I, I introduced him to a, a very British snack which is a thing called a Percy pig. <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Percy, Percy, Percy pigs. These gelatinous pigs that you can get in a... In a yes. A <laughs> that good. No, Judge That's Judy good. and Percy pigs in, in Lee Scoresby's <laughs> balloon. Culture is connected. The foundation of a strong friendship. Exactly Indeed. right. <laughs> and how about anyone else? Does, can you think of a, a moment where someone was getting into character and in a very strange way, perhaps listening to some odd music on, on the phone or what, what comes to mind? Um, well, um, think... Me and Daphne watched Top Boy. We watched Top Boy on <laughs> set. I was watching Top Boy came out and yeah. then uh, I was watching it on set. So I had my AirPods. Daphne will tell you that I always have my AirPods in. So we watched a lot of Top Boy. I made, yeah. I forced Daphne into watching Top Boy. And I'd love to know, you know, <laughs> after season one aired and you're out in the world and people now have enjoyed this gift that you've been sort of making under wraps all those months. Tell me a little bit about some of the fan reaction. Maybe you start with Arian, and I'd love to know, again, these fans are very intense. What was yeah. the most meaningful thing that some, someone said to you about not only what the series meant to them via the books, but also the way you brought it to life? Does something come to mind? Um, no, well, they're kind of, they weren't really meaningful for me. They were kind of like more like, I got the hot priest kind of thing next thing. Like, <laughs> that was kind of a bit scary. Like people were like, Quite some really strange DMs. People sliding into my DMs. <laughs> so I was like, yes, Ariel. Um, <laughs> yes, Ariel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, um, no, I was. I was just impressed by just how people were so taken by it all, and they were like shocked that I was so young. And they were shocked that um, I could be so cold. It was like quite a. It was, it was really people were really responsive to it. It was mad. Like every day, I was constantly getting stopped on the street, and like, you know, I think someone asked me to do. To, to do a birthday message in, in like their, their boreal style. And I was like, well, oh, okay. What's that? Yeah. Do it, do it, do it. Yeah, well, don't tell me. I'm doing please, do it. Arian, please. On set, on set, um, Arian did this thing where he made everyone, you know the advert, L'Oreal, because you're worth it. He mm -hmm. made everyone go, Boreal, because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. And that was really fun. Yeah, yeah. That was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he made me do it, it in like... Spanish, like, 
he made us do it. Everyone in there, that like, was crazy. It was, it was like for the trend on set. Like everyone was there. L'Oreal, because you're worth it. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This has been such an inspired, fun conversation, and we're so honored that you would take the time to join us and also that you worked so hard in making this television show, which, by the way, at a time when we've never needed television so much. So congratulations on an incredible achievement. And season two of His Dark Materials premieres this fall on HBO and BBC. And if you haven't already, please be sure to catch up on season one. And Jane, tell us what the best way for people to watch season one, just in case they may not know. BBC iPlayer, if you're in the UK, and through HBO Max, if you're anywhere else. Wonderful. (laughs) And those are global services, which is very handy. And you can also watch season one. The complete first season is now on digital, Blu-ray, and DVD in August. So anyone who hasn't caught up by then will be able to. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. And please join us on Twitter shortly with some cast for a live Q&A, and you can ask any questions that we may not have gotten to today. And thank you again, and congratulations, and stay well, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.